I hope everyone has enjoyed the final day of the MOA Symposium. I am honored to be rounding out the day with this on awesome panel of leaders who are transitioning and have transitioned from the role of athletic director. Um, we are very fortunate that we get to pick their brains a bit uh, as life of an athletic director. And these are three titans in our industry, um, people who have set the standard and that has, it is truly our privilege to have them here with us today. So I'm going to go ahead and welcome Dan Guerrero, who is UCLA's athletic director, has really set the standard, as well as Charlie Titus, who is at UMass Boston, and Debbie Yao from NC State. Uh, it is our privilege to have them all here today, and please check the chat area for links to their bios and the session description. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So Debbie and Charlie and Dan, if you wouldn't mind unmuting your videos. Are we all set? Debbie, you look great. Uh, it's it's know, working. Okay, good. You know, I told Desiree, I don't have an IT person here, so it feels pretty odd. <laughs> I need help. She helped me. She was my IT person. <laughs> which is really funny if you recognize my <laughs> level of like non-technological expertise. I was uh, texting Renee and I was like, hey, <laughs> can you help me? Um, and by the way, thank you very much for, to Renee Miles um, for your help, R Renee Miles Payne, uh, for your help on, on setting everything up today. Thank you, Renee. Um, so with that, go, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm gonna throw this one out since Debbie, you're right here. Uh, this has been an incredible time um, with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and Sean Reed and Tony McDade. And we all, um, we're all processing. We all recognize the hurt that communities are feeling, that our friends are feeling, our student athletes. Um, any, as you've transitioned from NC State, any advice for those of us that are working with student athletes um, that you could give us on, on your approach as the athletic director? To keep listening to each other and talking to each other and trying to remember that we care about each other. I think that when things are so volatile, Desiree, and so hurtful, it's really hard sometimes for people to listen. Um, you know, I, I, I don't even know this man, David Dorn, who was a retired police officer in uh, St. Louis who was killed, I think three nights ago, he was 77, uh, trying to protect a, a business. Um, I don't know that they'll ever find out who, who murdered him, uh, but there's just so much going on. I think, that, uh, I think that if you've had great relationships with your student athletes, this could all show up right now. Uh, in terms of people's ability to continue to care about each other and to listen and to talk through issues. And I know a number of ADs are doing that and coaches, a number of them are trying. You and I, I mean, I was a coach. This is kind of new territory for coaches in a way, uh, you know, as the authority, uh, authority figure related to the team. But I know a number of them are really uh, giving it a good shot. Uh, again, back to listening. Charlie or Dan, what feedback would you have? What reflections? What can we learn? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm having some technology, technology problems here today. The echo. Dan, why don't you go ahead while I All right, Charlie. Thanks. You know, uh, we need change, you know, and we need, we need true change, uh, you know, change that will ultimately allow us to find that peace that, that we're missing. I mean, I see Stan Johnson, uh, you know, in this meeting, Stan and I go way back, Stan, it's good, it's good to see you. And we've been talking about this for, for a long time. It's hard. And what many of our student athletes are witnessing right now is, you know, public stands against injustice that, um, that they've never experienced before. In fact, many on this call perhaps have never experienced. Uh, you know, what we're seeing now. And it's incredibly tragic. And it's tragic because our society, unfortunately, uh, continues to simply ignore the evidence. You know, I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. We're, 
in place of recognizing the truth, uh, in place of recognizing the facts and holding ourselves accountable um, you know, to the truth, we find ourselves often engaging in conversations that don't bear the kind of fruit that we want or the kind of change that, that we need. And let's be real. I mean, the playing field is, is littered with, uh, with casualties and there's no way that you can call that playing field uh, level. Uh, I mean, and it's been said over and over again, and we're trying to convey this to our student athletes that, um, you know, this is not incidental. It's something that's, that's systemic. And uh, you just look at the facts. I mean, blacks and, and Latinos, um, uh, you know, have been killed by the police at a rate of two and a half to two times more than, uh, than, than whites. I mean, it's just a, a fact and, and it's societal. And when you think of even COVID and what we're dealing with right now, it's the same thing. Uh, COVID is disproportionately killing Blacks and, and Latinos. And the reason is societal, whether it's the exploitation of essential workers or uh, you know, whether it's unequal access to the infrastructure and the resources that should be uh, you know, provided to, to everyone in society. Um, it's, it's there and it's a fact, you know, again, uh, we need change and we need to find, uh, we need to find uh, that piece that we're looking for to the extent that we can uh, by getting that, that true change. And this is what our student athletes are, are seeking. It's, it's not just about rhetoric. It's not just about, um, you know, talking about this, which is very, very, very important. But they're looking for us to provide guidance, uh, you know, action items and things of that nature as well. And, and, and that is our responsibility as leaders. Dan. Yeah, I think that um, one of the things that we have a golden opportunity of working with people who are going to be leaders. And so they have to be a part of the change. And I think that they're more than willing to do that. Um, I also think that there's, there are actions that are needed. And all of us have uh, associates, friends and colleagues who are working in major corporations and are in politics. And we have to uh, encourage them to make sure that those changes are taking place. You know, what, what is the plan of major corporations? What are their boards of directors look like? What are their senior leadership teams look like? And do they have a plan uh, to make sure that those changes are implemented? Those are the kinds of actions that people are looking for now. And again, our student athletes are, are looking for that change. And in the future, they are the future. They're part of that change. Thank you. Well, I just went and I did a quick survey of some of the folks and the names that I'm seeing on this call. And while I don't know everybody's names on here, I, I recognize an awful lot of great leaders, uh, the China Judes of the world and the Dinas, and uh, I see Brian Blair, and there's so many folks that um, I don't know, but I, and Dwayne Bailey's of the world. Um, this is a really talented group. You all are stalwarts in our profession. What advice, as we can prepare the next prepare the next great athletic directors like you all, could you give to this group? Uh, let's see who. Charlie, do you want to start us off since you just finished speaking? Yeah, I would say again the group um, that is assembled here today, and it is a very impressive group. I see a lot of my friends on here. Um, we have to continue to support those young people who want to be a part of the change and encourage others to join in that. That's really critical. We have to help pave the way. We have to be mentors. We have to help create opportunities for them to implement change and for them to be change. And so being supportive is really important. Um, opening doors of opportunity, really important. Um, being able you know, we, we want to have a conversation and we've offered a conversation with our student athletes, particularly um, our black and brown student athletes, to sit down with myself and other people who sort of lived this. And um, I've had some, some of these experiences throughout my life being stopped by police for no reason at all, except that I was black. Um, but to sort of talk to that and how you handle those kind of stops and how you channel the anger and where you really take it so that you can be effective. These are tough times, and I think that uh, there are a lot of young people who are just fed up. I am emboldened when I see and look at the demonstrations, see the multiculturalism in the demonstrations, the people who are participating, 
that's a lot different. I participated in the demonstrations back in the 60s, and I remember marching from Roxbury to Boston Common in a march led by uh, Reverend Martin Luther King. I was 15 years old. But that group looked a lot different than the groups I see out there today. So that's inspiring to me. And I think this feels a lot differently to me. We've got to be supportive. Charlie, I want to follow up a little bit. Um, there's a lot of talent on this call. And I think in the Power Five, we probably have less than 10 uh, women or people of color mm -hmm. that are sitting in the chair. You've sat in the chair and excelled. What advice do you have for the Dwayne Baileys of the world, um, the Siobhan Mansfields that are totally capable of sitting in these chairs and how do we help one another prepare? Well, I think the key word you just used is prepare, just to be prepared, prepare yourself well, uh, study, listen, learn, take advantage of every opportunity um, to increase your knowledge, to increase your skills. Um, and, and I think that, you know, develop the principles, and I'm sure people have, develop the principles that you're going to live and work by, and particularly the ones that you're gonna work by and, and be uncompromising in those principles. Um, and sometimes that's tough. You get into situations where people want you to do things and, uh, that are not aligned with the principles that you carry. And you've gotta to stick to your principles and stay true to them. You also have to understand that none of us accomplish by ourselves. And so <clears throat> know where your support bases are, use those support bases appropriately and help others along the way. Debbie, you've been an incredible help to me and have guided me throughout, throughout my tenure. Um, you're that person I call when I'm not quite sure how to handle something. Uh, what advice, um, and I almost hate sharing your advice because you've been such a wealth of knowledge. Um, but what advice would you have for this group? As they, I heard Charlie talk about preparation and principles and people that support you. Um, what else would you add as so that we can help position other folks to be in this chair? Okay, ah, big question. We need like an hour, Desiree, for that one question for yeah. the three of us to, to talk. Um, you know, I would say, first of all, manage your expectations. So uh, I'm, I'm going to talk primarily about being an athletic director, advancing in the field or in what I call the enterprise. Um, but as related to what is going on right now uh, socially, uh, all of that applies to managing uh, expectations. Listen, this is a matter of the heart more than anything else. So um, regulations are one thing. Uh, or another thing, there are a lot of different things you can do, but when, it, when you boil it all down, it's a matter of the heart. Uh, and that's a, that's a tough situation, a matter of the heart. I mean, people, you can force people to line up with a program and it doesn't change their heart and eventually it will all fall apart because they don't get it. So I'm gonna say that from, a, I, I, when I was named as athletic director in 1990 at St. Louis, University, it was the highest profile female hire in the nation at that point in time in Division I. A year later, Barbara Hedges was hired at the University of Washington and took that role until she retired in 2004. Um, and then in 94, I ended up going to Maryland, uh, as you know, and being the only female AD in the ACC for 22 years uh, until uh, Pitt and Virginia uh, hired females. But I would say this. Focus on your work, focus on your work. I'm not saying it's the only thing, I'm just saying we'd be really good at what we do because of point number two, which is you are disadvantaged and you're going to be disadvantaged. So I'm gonna go back to managing expectations because I am that person, I'm the realist. So there will always be a segment that looks at a female, whether gender minority or an ethnic minority and looks at that person and goes, they just don't belong in that role as an AD. I don't think they can get this done. I'm, I have never focused on them. I can't afford to. There's this large gray mass uh, there that I'm focused on. And those are the people that go, hmm, female AD? Oh, I've never heard of that. That was 1990, literally, I've never heard of that. But I don't know, maybe, I don't know. Let's see what she can do. So focus, acknowledge that 
uh, both ethnic minorities and gender minorities in athletics are still disadvantaged um, and move forward. You're creative, you have your own ideas, you, you, you're you going to have your shot. We all have our shot at who we hire, uh, which is the most difficult thing of all to do. Uh, but that has kept me uh, steady along with being sure that the people around me understand who I am and don't mind telling me when I'm wrong. I think that's the, a hard one. Uh, people care, uh, have my best interests at heart, but they're not afraid to say, I just keep, I don't see it. I'm not sure why you think that. Could you look at it another way? And those four components have made a huge difference for me when they were applied routinely. At the points in time, Desiree, over my 43 years in college athletics, when I didn't choose to apply those, I've usually failed, um, you know, when, when we all have failed uh, at various points. Uh, so at that point, it is what Kevin Anderson said, which is a teaching moment, and you hope you'll be better the next time, and you hope there is a next time. Thank you, Debbie. Dan, what would you add? And you've been a wonderful role model. Um, how can we what would you wish you would have known as you were starting your tenure and what advice do you have for this group in positioning themselves for leadership? Well, I, I would just like to echo what both, uh, uh, what both Char Charlie and, and, and Debbie indicated. Obviously the importance of mentorship can't be discounted. I mean, all of us have benefited from those who, who, uh, you know, crossed that path before us and, uh, it's our responsibility, obviously, to, uh, to continue to pass that on. And I remember the mentors that I had when I was younger, getting into this business at a small Division II school, not knowing what the future would look like, but knowing that um, there was a mountain to climb and that we're going to climb that mountain by, you know, by myself. And uh, the opportunity to engage with, uh, with individuals throughout, throughout my career, various stages of my career, uh, are extremely meaningful, and and that is really what allowed me the opportunity to uh, to sit in a chair at a place like UCLA. So, those of us who have spent a lot of time in this business are are, are grateful for the opportunity to give back in, in that regard. And so, I just uh, once again echo what uh, what Charlie indicated that that is incredibly important. And then um, you know Debbie talked about the old adage of managing expectations maybe the toughest challenge that we have as athletic directors. Because when you think about all of the stakeholders that we have to appease from your administration, to your faculty, to your staff, uh, to your coaches, to your student athletes, um, to, uh, to the parents, uh, to season ticket holders and donors, uh, to the media, uh, to the NCAA, your conference. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And you're not gonna be able to appease all of them. Uh, and when you make decisions, and even though they may be the right decision, you may make those decisions for the right values, you have to be courageous enough to be able to stand by those, uh, no matter what the consequences are. And, and that's tough to do because you can't be in the chair. You can't sit in this chair and not have thick skin. Uh, it'll eat you alive. And uh, you know it, Desiree, and, and, and Debbie and Charlie, and everyone that sits in the chair knows that. Uh, and so part of the grooming process, if you will, is to, for everyone to, to really have a very good understanding of what's important to them and what are their convictions. Because by and large, uh, you're going to have to live by those and, and, and you want to live by those. Uh, don't want to compromise uh, in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, I think that's, that's important for, for, for <clears throat> everyone to, to understand and, and, to, and to realize uh, and I'm sure those who are out there that, that are spending time with us today, you know, have a real good sense about that. Absolutely. Um, if you could, Charlie, or Charlie, if you wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit about one of your greatest challenges during your time as athletic directors. And those of you that are on, if you have questions, uh, please make sure and send them in to me via, uh, via the Zoom group chat, and I'll make sure and filter those. Well, there have been many, but you know, I think back to, in listening to Debbie, I think back to 1980 when I became the athletic director at UMass Boston and I was the only uh, minority athletic director in New England. And the first meeting I went to, <clears throat> um, 
it was an ECAC college athletic conference meeting. And as I walked in the room, everybody in the room was white, male, pretty much over 50 and smoking cigars. You could smoke in rooms in those days. <laughs> and uh, I just sort of looked around the room and said, my goodness, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> but <laughs> the challenge of, of integrating into that group was really something special for me. And it wasn't being accepted by the group, it was integrating myself into the group that I, that I really wanted to do. And um, we were able to do that. I think the other big challenge, it's, it happened at the same time, we had no athletic programs at UMass Boston when I was appointed. There was no history, there was no culture, there was no tradition. So it was building from scratch. And that was a huge challenge. Um, it was our first year in the NCAA. In those days, you just had to play in three seasons with uh, 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 men, particularly because they hadn't merged with the AIAW yet. So the challenge of building it from scratch, and we decided we were going to have a women's program at the same time, and putting that together and um, trying to build a culture to put in place things that would become traditions um, for our university and our athletic department early on. Um, and then getting the, uh, the university to understand the importance of athletics because we were, we were a commuter school. Um, we were put in place, the, uh, UMass Boston was put in place to serve the needs of uh, the working class in Boston, people who couldn't get to Amherst. The average age of our students were 27, was 27 years old. So there were a lot of people on campus and particularly in the academic areas who felt that athletics just wasn't necessary on that kind of campus. So to convince them and, and to, to uh, put them in a position where they became supportive was a major challenge. Thank you, Charles. Uh, Debbie or Dan, uh, what would you say were some of the biggest challenges and have those changed since when you look at it in 2020 lenses versus when you started? Well, I'll, piggy, I'll piggyback off of, off of Charlie's comments. I remember when I first became an AD in the, in the mid-80s at, at, at the Cal State Dominguez Hill, a small Division II school. And uh, at that time, you can count the number of Latino athletic directors on one hand. In fact, you can probably count them on two or three fingers. And I remember uh, the, same, the same experience in, in many respects, going to my first NCAA convention and not seeing anyone that looked like me at all. Uh, mm -hmm. I recognized that right away. And that was really a, a motivator and an inspiration for me to uh, to want to be a trailblazer, to want to make a difference uh, in this profession. And uh, I remember when I became the, the athletic director at, at UCLA, I realized in a lot of respects, I had beaten the odds and, and, and scaled the ladder, if you will. But then I also knew that the, the real work was, was just beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, in order for me to be successful, needed to have that possess that image and substance that, um, that would allow me to um, impress upon the constituent base that out there that was certainly going to be sizing me up as to whether I had the right stuff. Um, you know, could I in fact represent myself, my race, the, uh, the, you know, my family and, and UCLA in a manner of distinction that uh, is required of that university. But even more than that, could I, um, you know, could I meet the challenges and, and produce in terms of what was what was expected? So, uh, you know, the long journey, the long career to get to the chair uh, at, at UCLA uh, still required, uh, obviously, a, a great deal of fortitude uh, in order to have uh, the, the career that, that I've had there. Uh, and obviously, in, in, in this day and age, if you can last 18 years in, uh, in, one, in one job, that's, uh, that's pretty good stuff. But you know, I'll always be grateful for that first opportunity because it resulted uh, in many opportunities for me throughout my career. Dan, do you feel this um, pressure as a Hispanic female? And by the way, I don't think we've changed that much. I think there's probably like three of us now at FBS. Um, so I guess we have improved since when you got there. So yes, we're up, um, we're up 200%. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, I feel an inordinate amount of pressure uh, to do a good job or as best of a job as I can because I don't want to close the door for the next Hispanic female or the next woman 
Um, how have you handled that pressure? Well, I, I've never really seen it as pressure so much because everyone who sits in the chair wants to do a great job. And you want to, uh, you know, again, rep represent uh, represent uh, yeah, your university in, in, in the manner which is, uh, which is expected. And, and certainly we're all measured by, by what we produce, you know. And in many respects, it's wins and losses, it's graduation rates, it's, it's tangible, kinds of, tangible kinds of things. Uh, and there's, there's no difference as it relates to, uh, to minorities in this profession and the challenges that we've had over the years. My gosh. You know, I go all the way back to Minority Opportunities and Interest Committee when it first started with Charlie Whitcomb and, and, and with Stan and establishing the Fellows Program and, uh, you know, working from, through with the pipeline and, and, and through MOA. And, I mean, we worked hard at trying to create opportunities for, uh, for minorities to make it, you know, in this business. The fact that we're doing this session right now is once again reflective of that uh, you know, of, of that, of that challenge. And it's not just about uh, someone getting in the chair. I mean, we want to see individuals that are in the chair right now aspire for greater things. I mean, you talk about, you know, F FBS, you know, we need to have more minorities in, in, in the FBS. And, uh, and that's, again, that's just, that's, that's part of the challenge. And, uh, and it's something that we're all striving to make better. And at every level, not just FBS. So I don't mean to be exclusionary right. uh, because uh, we have student athletes at every level. And I think we all share the common um, goal and journey that we want our athletic leaders, regardless if they're in the chair or leading units to be reflective of our student athletes. Um, there was a question that came in or Dan, Charlie or Debbie, how do you mentally prepare yourself to do your job and leading an organization when you are the minority? Debbie, you have been the first in the ACC. You're the only woman in the room on for so many years. Um, it's, it's a challenging question because you've never been a, a white male. Yeah. So um, what advice would you have when you are, uh, how do you, Tell, reflect on that a little bit in terms of leading an organization when you're the only. You know, Desiree, people will follow you if they believe in your vision. Even if you're female, even if you're African American, even if you're Hispanic. So I will say to you that the uh, responsibility is on me to share the vision and to um, exhibit all the traits that I'm asking for them. So you lead by example. Uh, I remember when I was hired at St. Louis, uh, they asked the basketball coach at that time, uh, can a woman do this job? Now, I know that sounds crazy that you'd actually ask that. But well, they did. He said his question, his answer was, if any woman can, Debbie can. <laughs> you know, I'm like, come on, dude. There are a lot of women that can do this. So, and at Maryland, on the day of my press conference, we had a huge crowd in, in 1994, and there were a lot of boosters. And one of the prominent boosters said the following. It's a sad day for Maryland athletics. They just hired a skirt for the AD. So look, people will tell you these things because they love to share bad news. <laughs> they just, they want to be the one to let you know. You just have to decide who am I going to be and what am I going to listen to and how is it going to impact me? I can't afford to be offended every time somebody says questions whether or not a female can do the job. I wouldn't have time to do anything else. I want to focus on the vision and bring people with me and and knowing that it is an issue or has been an issue i will say this it has it is much better now that's my i don't have any empirical statistical data i have the life uh, life experiences i think it's better a lot better i think women have this opportunity so much more now than they they used to but you know i i'll bring it out in the open when i coached if I knew it was an issue on the team i would get them in the locker room and say we're going to talk about this i'm going to bring it out from the closet we're talking you know, we might or might not agree, but we're going to talk about it. And I would say the same thing if and when you're in the environment where you really feel it might be hostile or you, you, you're going to lose people because of this. You have to, you have to, you're going to live the life and you're going to be the person to do what you ask others to do. They see you leading by example. So, you know, they're much more likely to do what you ask if you're doing it yourself. And uh, other than that, talking about it when there's an issue that comes up. I know it sounds simple, but it isn't because people do not like to talk about situations and issues. They just don't. 
Uh, so, you know, how you set the tone uh, and begin that conversation, I think, is also would be my responsibility. And Debbie, uh, so shameless plug, but when I was at Virginia Tech, uh, we would look at NC State as a comparator <laughs> and as a competitor. And I remember doing a lot of analytics. Um, and if memory serves, so you talked about sharing the vision and building trust, but also yeah. proving some results. Because if memory serves, mm -hmm. y'all went from yes. 85, 85th to 15 in the Director's yeah. Cup under your 89. leadership. 89 to oh, 15. 89. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> well, I knew I should have pulled that, yes, that slide yes, up that so I prepared. People, so people will forgive you. People will forgive you if you're wrong. If you're not wrong often. The fact is, no one's right all the time. But if you're wrong constantly, then yeah, the day's going to come where they say, oh, I don't know if she knows what she's talking about. But when you see results, Desiree, wow, things really escalate in quite a, quite a fashion because now they get pretty energized about the vision. I want to be part of that. This is going to help my career. I'm going to put that on my resume because I was part of her team. It's, it's, it's good stuff. 89 to 15. That's pretty impressive. Charlie, um, a question came in, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or you could give us a little bit of your philosophy. Uh, in light of seeing universities discontinue sports, what processes or conversations go into place when making those considerations? Well, I think if you're going to discontinue, you know, all, all stakeholders have to be involved in those kind of decisions. And we had a, a situation where we actually eliminated football. Um, I play football. I'm, I'm a lover of football. I didn't want to eliminate it. Um, so we, we decided there, were, there was a big push to do that on our campus. And what we did, or what I did was put together a sports sponsorship committee. And we looked at all of the sports. And we had a process. And on the committee was a member of the board of trustees. There were student athletes on the committee. There were coaches. On, the football coach was actually on the committee. Um, so we made sure that, that alum were on the committee, all the, all the stakeholders were sitting at the table. And we had a process to look at every single sport and criteria for um, why we, what, would what would help us have good sports at UMass Boston. That criteria included that we have the facilities, that we have a recruitment base, and all the things that you need uh, to be good in a particular sport. And after we applied all the criteria and much discussion, it was clear to everybody at the table that football just wasn't going to work at a division three commuter school um, without a fan base, without a recruitment base, um, without uh, um, a cafeteria for meals and, and all the kinds of things you need to be successful in football. So we eliminated football, but I think it's important that there's a process. If you're going to eliminate sports, it shouldn't be really nilly or just one person's decision. There should be a process with stakeholders involved. Thank you, Charlie. Um, okay, the next question comes in. Uh, how can we better recruit other minorities, uh, for example, Hispanics, Asians, into college athletics? Would you charge the, dis I'm sorry, charge the disengagement from these minorities on their cultural backgrounds? Uh, who would like to take that one? I guess increasing representation of other minorities into college athletic, and the person that asked the question, did you mean athletic, I'm assuming you mean athletic administration. Okay, I see a shaking of the head. Who would like to take that one? I see a bunch of not it, so okay. Um, all right, let's go in alphabetical order. Uh, Dan, yeah, where are yeah. you? <laughs> well, I mean, how do we have it? Let me, let me rephrase. How do we create an inclusive environment for a myriad of folks? I think I well, stayed true to the integrity of the question. Yeah, and, and it, 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 it boils down to hiring decisions. There's no question about that. And, and, and how you value uh, a diverse culture in your, in, in your program. Uh, and ultimately, if, uh, if you feel that it's an important uh, aspect of, of, of your organization, then you will do everything you can to uh, to make certain that you foster that that kind of environment through your hiring processes, uh, and that means that you can be cultivating those uh, those individuals within the infrastructure of your uh, your university and or your own program. Uh, I certainly at UCLA we have a number a number of interns, for example, or or grad students that work in our program that ultimately we hire because they are very very talented. 
and want to get into athletic administration. And they are very diverse in terms of, uh, in terms of their, uh, um, you know, their, uh, uh, you know, their, their, their backgrounds. And, uh, and, and so we've taken great, great pride in that. And, uh, and we've seen them grow, not only through our program, but to get the opportunity to then move uh, to other universities to, uh, to continue to build their career. But um, again, it, it boils down to an, an individual's priorities and uh, their perspectives in terms of, of what's important for their organization. You know, Desiree. Go ahead, I'm sorry, Charlie. The reality is that um, young minorities who want to get into this business, no matter what ethnic minority they are, probably have much more of an opportunity than they did in 1980, than people did in 1980. And I think that um, I, I, what Dan is saying, it, it makes, makes most sense to me. And that is that all of us who are in positions now have to help create pools. I believe in positioning. And if the pools are strong, um, then it does get down to a hiring decision. But if, if a president has a pool that has um, <clears throat> Four, four candidates and three are strong minorities, there's a little position in there. So I think that, that that's an important part of it. I think that the things that, are, that Moa, are, Moa are doing to uh, uh, create uh, pathways, the NCAA's pathway program is another way. And I think that we all have to participate in that. You know, once you get to a position, it doesn't make sense, at least to me, that you not reach back and participate in that struggle and continue to be a part of the struggle. I never looked at myself, even in 1980, as the black athletic director. That's not who I wanted to be. I wanted to be the highly competent athletic director who did a good job. The reality is I am black, but you know, that sort of takes care of itself if you're very good at what you do. So what I'm hearing from you, Charlie, and what I know from what Dan has done for me and what Debbie has done is not only providing context, but providing mentorship. And no matter how busy um, people's schedules were, I knew if I really needed to talk with Dan or Debbie, I could text them. Um, and they, they were never too busy and they never made me feel um, that I didn't matter. And I try and do that same behavior. Uh, I don't always succeed, but because of examples like Dan and Debbie. Uh, and Charlie, I know you've set the standard as well. So one thing, as we're all rising, it's so incredibly important. What I'm hearing from you is to make sure that you're bringing other folks along with you. Um, you know, Desiree, if I could just add, add one more thing. And, and again, it's, it's, it's really a testimony to NACTA and what NACTA has meant to, to our profession. I mean, over 30 affiliate organizations now. I mean, I remember going to NACTA many years ago, and it certainly doesn't look like it does now. But I love going to NACTA because you get an opportunity to interact with a lot of young professionals, including your colleagues, obviously, um, and because you go there for, you know, for, various, for various reasons. But uh, you know, to see the composition of the NACTA population now, if you will, is, is so energizing and, and refreshing. And it does give us an opportunity to, you know, to meet with, uh, with these, these individuals and talk about uh, talk about next steps and talk about, uh, you know, strategies for their careers. Um, it, it's, it's just a wonderful environment. You know, Mike Cleary obviously started it many years ago. Bob's doing a terrific job uh, right now sustaining and building NACTA. And, uh, you know, I'm just very grateful for, for that opportunity because it's such a reflective of, of, of something positive in, in our profession. Absolutely. And also one thing that um, advice that I've been given, and when I'm at NACTA, I'm recruiting, right? I'm looking for the next great talented uh, person that I, because I always want to build our team with talented people. So just know when you're going to NACTA, it's not mm -hmm. one of those situations where you're just collecting a stack of business cards. You're developing real relationships because you never know who's looking and who's watching. Um, Debbie, this next question. Can I say uh, something about what you just yes, said? So also guys, uh, guys meeting, this is a F in mankind, not men or women. Uh, when you go to NACTA, look, if you want to be at the bar at one in the morning, you can't. I knew you were going to go there. I'm just telling you, you will attract, you'll, tr you know, you attract people in that way. Just, just, just know there are other ADs that just don't want somebody 
to work for them that's going to be at the national convention at the bar at one in the morning. And there's some that don't have any issue with it at all. So think through kind of how you manage yourself. Uh, it'd be the same thing I would say to a female in, um, hmm, I would try to say it delicately, but I don't want to see cleavage at the office. I'm not interested in seeing cleavage at the office. You're not, no one's there to get a date. We're there to work. Uh, and uh, could you just pay a little bit more attention to what you look like from a professional perspective because it, it makes a difference. You're representing us, not you, us. So, sorry, that's, right. that's Debbie, she's keeping it real. Y'all didn't know that you were gonna talk about cleavage on this, but here we go. Okay, um, so don't go to NACTA and go, don't get a date and don't be at there at one o'clock in the morning. But in all truth, I did meet with a search firm, this is about five or six years ago, and, and he was telling me that he had a, someone that he was gonna hire or he was helping with a deputy AD search. And this deputy AD candidate was in the bar at NACTA at one o'clock in the morning. He noticed it and he automatically pulled him from the pool. So don't be the queen of the or the king or the queen of the lobby. Go there and make real relationships. Uh, let's see here. All right, about mentor. Uh, uh, goodness, about mentors. If a potential mentee out of the blue emails or calls you wanting you to be a mentor, how receptive is that approach? If it isn't a receptive way, what is the best practice? Um, Debbie, do you want to take this one? Well, I, I think that I, I don't, I can't speak uh, for Dan or Charlie. I, I, I'm very cautious about people I don't really know and telling them I'm going to serve as their mentor. I don't know them. I don't, I'm not sure I want to serve as their mentor. I don't know enough about them. I have hundreds of former student athletes and a number of them would like the same thing. And sometimes I'm, I'll meet with them for coffee even now to talk about next steps in a career and that kind of thing. But I take it seriously, Desiree. So it's a different kind of, if you, if you said to me, can I call you and ask you a question or two? Sure, that's no problem. But being your mentor to me is a serious commitment and I can only do that and do it well with a, with a, a limited number of individuals. Yeah, Desiree, I'll, I'll spin off of that. I, I, I appreciate what, what Debbie's saying there and it makes a lot of sense because you get contacted by a lot of individuals you know, over the course of time. And, um, I'll always get back to someone that makes that uh, makes the inquiry uh, and uh, and and have that conversation, that initial conversation. Uh, and it's just like when someone asks asks you to be a reference for a job, and right. you haven't seen that person in 15 years. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be of any benefit to that person if someone calls me and says, "Hey, tell me about this person," and I, I have to be I have to be honest and say, "Hey, I haven't seen him in 15 years." So uh, it's the same thing with uh, you know with uh, you know, having mentees and, and serving serving as, as a mentor, you want to develop a relationship. And once you're able to develop that relationship, you can you can uh, you can ascertain to what extent you could be a, a, a good mentor for that person and a responsible mentor. Because if you can't give them the time, then it, it really isn't uh, it really isn't meaningful for for anyone. So uh, yeah, you have to be strategic about about how to go you know, how to go about doing it and, and, uh, and who you're going to work with. But, um, but again, if you're going to make that commitment, then you have to make that commitment and, and really serve uh, at the interest of that person in a lot of respects. You know, I've done countless of what I call informational interviews from cold calls. And I don't mind doing that. It, it takes time, but I do it as much as I can. Um, but one of the things I'm most proud of, and I think the real mentoring for me has been done with my team. And one of the things I'm most proud of, we have seven former team members who have gone on to become athletic directors, conference commissioners, and all seven of them were minority of women. So I'm, I'm real proud of that. And that's where I think the real mentoring gets done. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Charlie, while we're on, uh, being in the top chair comes with a great responsibility and it seems like at times it can be slightly lonely. How do you keep yourself sharp and on a continuous path of growth to avoid stagnation? Yeah, well, you, you have to be on 24-7. I mean, unfortunately, we, we can't be off at all. But um, I think that you have to have some things that, that are important to you outside of, uh, outside of the office. And um, you know, my family has been extremely important to me. It has been a rock as I've gone through 40 years at UMass Boston. 
Um, I enjoy reading, and I, I think that being a lifelong learner is really important um, to help you sort of maintain. Um, and then, you know, conversations with colleagues who are in similar situations is, is always helpful. Um, and I think you have to have hobbies, you know. Um, for as much of the time as I could, I continued to play pickup basketball. And when that ended, I, I went to golf, you know. So I think that you have to have releases, something that sort of allows you to sort of de de-stress, debrief, and then get back at it. Yeah, or Debbie, did you want to add anything to that? I just want to say, Desiree, about the mentorship part for people on, on the call or on the Zoom. Uh, Bob Bodine wrote this book, and it's called You Got Who? Bob Bodine, he's out of Dallas. It's Bodine Executive Search. Um, great book. And his premise is this, and he'll, he'll walk you through it in the book. You already know who you need to know to advance. It's, a, it's just a very different, very interesting read. Uh, it's the first book he ever wrote. He's written another one since then called Two Chairs. Yes. It was a conversation between him and God in, in the other chair. And uh, he has told me he's going to write three more. I don't know when those are happening, but I did really, really appreciate You Got Who. I think a lot of times people say, I just don't know the right people. I just don't. I need to meet him or I need to meet her, but they're really not taking the inventory they need to, the contacts they already have. And that's what the book helps them, uh, walk, walks them through how to do that. He, he talks about directors and how you create a board of directors for yourself. I think, you, I think people would find it very interesting. I don't remember what quite your question was. You can go to Charlie or Dan with that, but I just want <laughs> We already left the subject and I, yeah, I wanted we to I, I, you know, yeah, go ahead, Dan. I was just going to say, it, it, so much of it just boils down to building relationships and, and building bridges. Yeah. I mean, and that's and, and there's so much there's so much to that, and it doesn't matter, um, you know, if you're Hispanic, if you're if you're African American, whatever the case may be, it's it's really taking advantage of those of those opportunities that are presented yourself. So you're building bridges within the infrastructure of your campus, you're building bridges with alumni, you're building bridges with your student athletes, you're building bridges and developing relationships with your coaches and your staff. Um, and, and as Charlie indicated, it's 24-7, 365. You can't get into this business and just like it. You have to love it because you are making major sacrifices and major commitments uh, at the expense sometimes of your family or whatever the case may be. I, I was very fortunate that as I grew in this profession, uh, I, I didn't have football, if you will, in, uh, in, in the fall that is, that is so consuming in many ways. And so I was able to see my two daughters grow and go to their recitals and go to soccer games and, and, and volleyball matches and, and, and enjoy that on, on, my, on my way up the, uh, the ladder. But uh, again, you have, to, you have to love this thing. And when I talk to to individuals who are trying to get in this profession, that's the first thing that, that I will tell them. Don't get in this if, if you're not willing to pay the price. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, again, just uh, very, very important uh, for all of us who are in this business because I think we all know it. It really is a way of life and you gotta love people because the whole business is built on people and developing real authentic relationships. Um, we have about uh, 10 minutes left and so I want to make sure that we get to all the questions and then I'll add, we'll finish up in the last five minutes with closing comments from our from our esteemed panel. Um, Tony Ann was talking about book lists that she's adding two chairs to her book list. So Tony Ann, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, it's a really good one. Uh, Dan and Debbie and Charlie so that uh, folks have a well-rounded book list like Tony Ann uh, what are you reading, or what book that you would think that, that has impacted you? <laughs> um, I, when I read, I, I read for, um, especially at this point in time in my career, I, I read uh, books that are of particular interest for me outside of, uh, of athletics. So I'm reading The Life and Times of Thelonious Monk right now. Um, that's that's uh, when, I, when I get free time, when I'm on the road, I will always look for the, uh, the, the, the closest jazz club so I can uh, go there for sanctuary. And so can't give you more, much more advice than that at this point. 
While you ask, Desiree, while you ask Charlie, I'm going to the bedroom to get my book. Be sure I get, get the right title. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, I'm a lot like Dan. I mean, at this point, I, I have been, and I'm trying to think, I got a, a shelf uh, full of uh, management and leadership books in my office. I'm trying to think of some titles, but right now I'm reading, going back and reading all the John Grisham books that I missed. I love John Grisham and his, his uh, legal mysteries. And I, I just read as much as I can of them. Awesome. Charlie, a question came in. Um, as an athletic director, what advice can you offer regarding building relationship with alumni who may feel detached from the athletics department or university? That's an interesting question for me because we, our predecessor school was Boston State College. And um, in 1982, we merged with Boston State and it was a, a, a contentious merger and most of the alum from Boston State didn't want any part of UMass Boston. And so they had, Boston State had a very, very strong athletic history in Division Three, And um, we, we needed to figure out a way to reach out to the athletic uh, alum from Boston State. Um, and so there were two things that we did. One is that uh, when we merged, um, I guarantee that nobody from the athletic from department from Boston State would lose their job and we would bring them all over. And we were the only division within the university that was able to do that and we did it. And so that was a way for us to make sure that some of the connections stayed in place. The relationships with that, that that staff had with student athletes who had come through their program. The second thing we did, um, we established the UMass Boston Athletic Hall of Fame um, long before we had a, a long history <laughs> and was really ready to establish it. And, and in the early years, we really leaned on the student athletes from Boston State and uh, made them a part of UMass Boston's Athletic Hall of Fame. And so now, a lot of that, those alums feel like if they said, well, where did you go to school? UMass Boston. They feel like it's their school now. So that was a, a major reach for us. And it, 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 it has paid off handsomely in uh, our support and some of our fundraising and those kinds of things. Wonderful. Debbie, did you get the book? And then I'm going to ask for closing yeah. comments. Yeah, the book is the, here it is, The Power of Right Thinking, Transform Your Thoughts, Transform Your World. It's by Carrie. It's a K-E-R-R-Y, Carrie Kirkwood. And um, I, I wanted to read it because I know everything, I believe everything starts with how we think. So if we think wrongly about a subject, everything that follows from there will be wrong and it will be a failure. And if we think correctly about it and we can judge a situation correctly, starting with how we think about it, then it changes our attitude, that changes what we say, that changes what we do, and that changes the outcomes. So uh, I, that, that's, my, that's, that's my closing statement, actually. That's well, yeah, I can't let you off too easily, um, because Kevin, Kevin asked a question, and it was specifically for you. And he said, as you stated the importance of knowing and having a vision, how often do you all review and tweak your vision? Good question, Kevin Wilson. Oh, look, this is like strategic planning, which all strategic planning is, is the roadmap. If you put it on the shelf after you do it, then it's just such a waste of time. You've got to constantly go back and reference it, think about it, think where you failed. This, again, that's why I love this book, The Power of Right Thinking. You know, every, we can, we're all going to be wrong. I think Kevin said that earlier. Uh, the question is why? Do we ever go back and talk about why we were wrong? What was it we thought that turned out not to be correct? That, that's such a painful exercise, but it's so important, Desiree, uh, if we're going to really get better at our craft and what we do and what we have to offer other people. Thank you, Debbie. And, and thank, you for, thank you for being on this call today, and thank you for all that you've done and all the barriers that you've broken. Desiree knows I had an, a call coming up that I had to, had to leave for. So when we were behind, I was completely freaked out, guys. I'm like, I hope I can stay on this call long enough to even be able to contribute. So I'm going to figure out, Desiree, how to leave, I hope. And thank you for including me and wish everyone well. Stay safe. Thank you, Debbie. See you, Debbie. Bye, See you later, Bye guys. Take care. Take care.
Um, all right, Dan and Charlie, in these last couple of minutes, what closing <clears throat> comments can this talented group of people, um, what would you like to share with them? I would say um, a couple of things. One, plan. Always be a planner. Um, you know, when, when I was coaching basketball, I, I used to say to our, our assistants all the time, um, we've got to make sure that our practice plans are right. We've got to make sure our game plans are right. Show me someone who fails to plan, and I'll show you someone who plans to fail. I believe in that statement. So be a planner. Um, be inclusive. Know that you have the ability to learn from those that are members of your team, people you work with. Listen. It's important to be inclusive. It's important that people feel that they're a part of the planning process. You'll get buy-in in that way. Um, and then I, I said this earlier, I think that it's important to have the principles that you're going to lead by and work by. And you can't compromise those. And sometimes you get into situations where it's going to be difficult to stand by them. But if you believe in, in those principles, then you got to stick with them all the way through. And I think at the end of the day, it will serve you very well. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah, I, I love that, Charlie. How you do things is just as important as what you produce. You know, running a right. program with integrity and, and sticking with your convictions. I, I, I believe in that wholeheartedly and, and appreciate you, you saying that. You know, one of the questions that athletic directors are asked a lot, uh, and certainly, you know, you – I mean, throughout your entire careers, what are those things that keep you up at night, right? They always ask you that question. And I would always usually answer that by just saying managing expectations, which is, uh, which is something that we covered earlier. But, but now, you know, I, I go back to, to one of the thoughts that, uh, and one of the things that I've, I've said over the years, that, that college athletics uh, changes like the sands of the Sahara. I mean, it's, it's constantly evolving. No two days are alike, as you well know, when you mm -hmm. go into the office. And as you look towards the future, and certainly, you know, we're stepping out of it to, to some degree. I don't think we'll be completely out of it ever. But, um, but you look to the future, and, and I just want everyone to look to the future with optimism in spite of, of all of the stuff that we're dealing with. Because, you know, we always get to the other side of things. There's no question about that. And, you know, when you start to look at, at the issues that are, that are in front of us right now, whether it's, you know, the... The, uh, the difficulty that have been caused by the, the pandemic and, and the implications on that, on, on budgets and the, and the financial implications for, for schools. That's going to be hard to deal with. There's no question about that. But, but we're going to get through that. When you start looking at uh, the implications of name, image, and likeness and what that's going to look like as we're trying to put our arms around what it really means, um, you know, we're going to get through that. Uh, when you start talking about one-time transfers and, and the implications of that, uh, some are all for that and some aren't, but we're going to get through that. And that's the, the one thing about our, our business is that we've been able to be resilient and, and adapt and adjust. I'll call it a market correction, if you will, in terms of what we're going through right now. But, uh, but college athletics uh, is, is obviously a, a wonderful enterprise. What we do for so many student athletes, uh, as trite as that may sound, is really what drives us. And, uh, and then again, we just need to be so, so conscious about our student athletes and, and what they're experiencing and what they're, they're going through. I mean, certainly the mental health of our student athletes right now and those issues have come to the forefront of our, of our enterprise in, in recent years. It's a, a, a top of mind of every coach uh, that you talk to for the most part. And we have to prioritize mental health just like we prioritize physical health and make sure that we put commitments uh, to that as we do to keeping our athletes in shape and getting them ready for competition. Um, but again, be optimistic about what the future looks like uh, because we'll persevere. I mean, who's, who's better suited to deal with adversity than people who have been in the battle, in the arena? That's us. So good luck to you all. Well, thank you to Dan. Thank you, Charlie. Um, we have learned an awful lot during this panel. And what Dan said was accurate. We all played sports or we all love sports and I have never been a part of a game or a regatta or a track meet where everything went according to how I wanted it to go. But what we all do and what our student athletes do every single day is they adjust in advance. Um, thank you for taking the time today. I hope that you were able to get some, a few nuggets out of that. These are some legends in our business. Um, and speaking of great professionals in our business, we, I'm going to turn it over to our MOA president, China Jude. 
uh, to close us out. So thank you for having us.